Hey everyone, Eric Gonzalez here from Produce Like a Pro. In today's episode, we have Adam Steele from Hot Pulse Studios joining us. He's got a great series coming up, the Ultimate Series. This is the first episode of it, Ultimate Drums. Adam is gonna take us through the process of how he recorded these drums and how he mixed them, and all the different techniques and mics that he used on them. He'll also be explaining what he's got in store for us in the future Ultimate episodes. Also, Adam has some courses out on promixacademy.com, the ultimate guide to Reaper, as well as understanding audio essentials like compression, EQ, reverb, and delay. Click the link below to check out the courses, and of course, check out his YouTube channel, Hot Pulse Studios. Now to Adam to explain the series coming up and to start us off on episode one of his Ultimate series with Ultimate Drums. Hi everybody, Adam Steele here, and I hope you're all doing well. I am rebranding my channel at the moment. It's going to be Adam Steele rather than just Hot Pole Studios. And as a result, I'm changing a lot of things, which is where this video comes from. This is going to be a series searching for my kind of ultimate drum sounds, guitar sounds, bass sounds for like hard rock and classic metal and that kind of thing. Not extreme metal. That's what Christian Kohler does. And he does it really well. Check out the Kohler Audio Cult that. But yeah, one of the things that I'm going to be doing as part of this rebrand is re-recording my theme song, uh, which originally sounded like this. Which is okay, but that was all done with like, virtual drum libraries, virtual guitar amps, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it was what I had access to at the time. Now, uh, the drums have been re-recorded for that using one of, in my opinion, the best drummers there are. A guy called Mike Malian. Mike plays in a band called Monuments, and he's played on the prog and prog metal scene for a long time. Guys like Tosin Abassi and uh, Misha from Periphery uh, really rate him. There was a video that uh, Rick Beato did recently where they had an interview and they all talked about Mike and gave him a name check there. He's in incredibly good. And me and Mike were in a studio in England called Middle Farm Studios, which is one of the nicest sounding drum rooms, one of the best studios in the country. Uh, we were recording something for Mike, but I also took the opportunity to get him to play drums for the theme song while we were there. For the rest of this series, I'm going to be doing the ultimate bass here and show you step by step, and the same for the guitars, choosing amps, mic techniques, clever parallel tricks and things that you might not have thought about. But for the drums, I'm going to kind of walk you through what we've already done. Uh, the drum choice, tuning choice, mics, positioning, weird stuff, and also the mix. So I'm going to talk you through what we've done so far. So Mike was playing his DW kit, which was a four tom setup, which was kind of not useful for my theme song, but the other piece that we were working on had quite a lot of tom runs. Uh, it also had a very punchy kick drum. Uh, the snare was a Brady, which are incredibly rare, and gave us a big, fat, wooden, snappy punch that's, you know, very desirable in the rock and metal thing. The other choice I would have gone with would have been a very thick, heavy bell brass snare, but Mike really has a preference for his uh, wooden... Brady, so that's what we went with. And also the symbols that Mike uses are minor symbols, and as you can see, he uses a lot of them. But it's very much orchestrated in terms of big crashes, smaller, shorter splashes, uh, China off to one side, uh, there's a stack that provides a more percussive thing, and he, importantly, chose some of the more bright and brilliant symbols in those ranges, because those help it to, kind of frequency-wise, sit above the shells and really project through. For kind of uh, more jazzy and more intricate stuff, he also has a set of darker symbols, which are not really appropriate for the big crashy rock thing uh, because they don't really kind of sit above in that frequency range. It can be done and there are drummers that do it, but I find that for kind of the easiest mixing experience, you want your kick drum to be down low, snare in the middle, toms also kind of in the middle but panned and then cymbals tonally kind of sat above. That makes life that much easier in the mix. These were recorded at Middle Farm Studios, like I said, which has a big stone live room, which means it's very reverberant, very echoey, but in a very pleasant way. There are a couple of gobos behind him, which you can see, which are 12 foot gobos, which stop the main reflection of the sound bouncing back and forth in the room. 
and mean that the sound projects across the room kind of comes back and then becomes more diffused and doesn't give us a slap back problem. Tuning of the drums is incredibly important and arguably more important than any of the microphone or mixing choices. If the drums themselves don't sound good, no amount of mixing is going to rescue that. And Mike is incredibly good at tuning drums. The kick drum is usually tuned, especially in rock, very, very loose on the batter head and then just tight enough on the resonant head to kind of give that warmth to, uh, to go with the attacky click on the batter side that doesn't then ring for days. I know a lot of jazz guys like a lot of ring on the kick drum. In rock, there's no space in that low area. The snare is tuned with the, the underside very tight and then the top tuned to a particular note. Uh, they're very similar with the toms where they're all tuned to a particular note uh, with a slight offset between the heads. And in between each take, we made sure everything was in tune. Very much like tuning a guitar. It doesn't matter how good your guitar is, uh, it doesn't matter how good your amp and everything is, if nothing's in tune, it's exactly the same with drums. Uh, the uh, lower toms I think were dampened a little bit, but there was nothing major in terms of dampening. Because well-tuned drums, especially with the right difference between the heads, they shouldn't ring forever and ever and ever. And they want to sound quite open. And admittedly, I did gate, especially the higher toms, uh, in the mix, which we'll get to. But that was much more because of bleed and spill than because of the drum itself. It does also help if you have a drummer that can absolutely pound the living daylights out of the shells. That really helps project the sound out, which sounds silly, but then the balance between, say, the snare mic and the hi-hat mic is shifted towards the snare so that the bleed isn't so much of an issue. Little things like that, I say it's little, it's a big thing, but that kind of detail can go a long way. So if you can encourage a studio drummer, especially in rock and classic metal, to really put everything they have into every hit, that again tonally makes a massive difference. So now for the things that I'm sure you wanted to hear, all the nerdy stuff like the microphone choices, preamp choices, extra gear that we used. Whenever I'm doing ultimate setup on the drums, I used three microphones on the kick drum. Sounds excessive, but I'll explain why. Especially live, we often use one microphone on a kick drum and then we EQ it as best we can to do what we need uh, because especially live efficiency and immediacy are important. But in the studio, I find that the sound of EQs, especially on a kick drum, can be very apparent. So what I do is I have the three different elements that blend together to give me different characteristics of the drum. And then if one is too much or not enough, I can just ride faders. Number one is the inside kick mic. And it's a classic that it's a Shure Beta 91A, a little square thing, uh, which is a boundary microphone. And they are very often put inside of kick drums because they give a little bit of an immediate low end thump but the main star attraction of those is that click. You get a very definite, slappy, immediate click coming off that microphone, which can really help to keep uh, a kick drum forefront of a mix, but only for that tiny little split second that the beater is hitting the drum. And that makes it much less of a mix nightmare than some of the other microphones where we're trying to bring out that click and bringing other things like bleed with it. The outside kick mic was a classic. It was the AKG D12. Not the D112, which is the more modern kind of egg-shaped mic, but the bigger, squarer D12, which for a lot of like classic music without lots of distorted guitars does have a really good balance of weight to help a kick drum cut through a mix. And the weight aspect is definitely what we want, even on the heavier rock stuff. Uh, but on its own, it doesn't cut through. That's where that Beta 91A comes in with that clicky clicky, which again, depending on the genre, depending on the song, that click can be overbearing and can be quite annoying. So we balance the two to get that weight that sits it in the mix with a bit of that aggression that sits it in kind of what I call the, the front space, right in front of the listener rather than just being felt. The 
third choice is something that I'm sure a lot of you have seen, which is a sub kick. This is a homemade sub kick that was made out of a drum shell with a speaker. Something I've done very similarly. I've got a, something like that in my live room that I've made. There are other companies that make them. Yamaha used to make one called the sub kick. Uh, Solomon make the low freak. It, what it is, is essentially a speaker driver that's been wired backwards to be used instead of uh, a traditional small capsuled microphone. And on its own, it sounds pretty bad. But what that does is it does a kind of a, a magic with physics where the bigger the, the diaphragm on a microphone, the slower the transient response, the less detailed. And so what it gives us is kind of in, in a physics perspective, a low, slow whoomp off the kick drum, which fills out a space after the initial hit. Not long enough to be a, something that rings, but what you'll find is that if you looked at the waveforms stacked up against each other of those three elements, the inside mic has a, a click, the outside mic has the next bit, and then the sub kick has that kind of weight. We're talking milliseconds here, but the combination gives the click, woomph, woomph. And just blending in enough of each one really lets that be its own thing in the mix. With minimal gating, with minimal processing, we can balance those to make it feel full and also aggressive all at once. Now, miking up the snare, we decided to be incredibly luxurious and use two Neumann vocal mics on the top and the bottom. I think they were the KMS 105s. Uh, those had a very uh, open, very neutral response. I do like to use a condenser uh, generally on the top of a snare, which I know is an unusual choice, but I like a slightly smoother uh, sound off a snare than uh, what something like a, an SM57 would give you. Having said that, if I was to do this again, I would go back and add something like an SM57 next to the top mic just to give me more of an angry kind of crunch out of the snare. I did have to do a little extra work in the EQ stage afterwards to bring some of that out. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about the toms as well. Um, these are really expensive mics to put near a drummer, but I trust Mike Malian not to batter the poor microphones because he's a very accurate drummer. Um, if you don't trust the drummer so much, don't use such expensive fancy mics. And the reason we use them is that um, Middle Farm had them in stock and we looked at them and went, those look like they might work. We tried them sound-wise, they did what we were after. If they didn't do what we were after, we would have switched them even though they were expensive. That's always a good warning. Don't just grab a microphone and put it on a drum or something because it's your most expensive mic. Use the one that's most appropriate. And luckily for us, because the uh, the 105 is a hypercardioid and rejected quite a lot of uh, background noise, these did work really well in context. On the toms, we went luxurious as well. Uh, we really like condensers on toms. They really give you a more open sound than a lot of dynamics do. And we went with AKG 414s on every tom, which is a lot. And yeah, if we did it again, I... The choices were classic vintage Sennheiser 421s or the 414s. We went with the 414s, we did a sound check, and they just sounded really good. So, again, with a lot of drummers, that if you wouldn't trust them not to hit the mic, maybe don't use your classic 414s, but that's what we had, and that's what worked for us. There are plenty of other condenser mics you can try in there. The main thing with Toms is making sure that you choose microphones that don't pick up lots and lots of bleed. I mean, yes, a lot of microphones are described as cardioid, super or hypercardioid, but within different manufacturers and different elements and different dynamic condensers, different designs, um, they do pick up more or less uh, sound at different frequency levels, which is the most important thing. If you look at those graphs that you get with microphones, they'll quite often for a cardioid have the bubble at the front, but then they'll have different colors or different patterns of bubbles that are to do with say, uh, what happens at 100 hertz, 250, 500, 1K, etc. And they all look quite different. You might find in that main vocal range, a cardioid mic is cardioid as expected, but 
at the upper range or the lower range, you might find that a microphone is more directive or less, more omnidirectional than you realized. So absolutely check that out for any microphone that you've got. You might find that they're not this single pattern that you thought they were. So yeah, give that a look. So the overheads were a blend of a pair of Coles 4038s and some small diaphragm condensers, which if I remember rightly were Neumann KM184s. Nice uh, open sounding overheads, uh, really good to have as that big kind of space. Where it gets fun is the room mics. So in the middle of the room was an AEA stereo ribbon, uh, which was uh, attached to a pair of cloud lifters, which gives the kind of the big sound of the drums, but from kind of a, a semi neutral perspective, I guess, with the drums in front. And so there's quite a lot of kind of bigness of the shells that comes through on that particular set of mics. The other secret weapon was another pair of AKG 414s right at the back of the live room, which I can't even get a shot of, unfortunately, but they're right at the back in one of my favorite setups, which is facing the wall, maybe an inch away from the wall. So with the capsule facing the wall, and that way, when you flip the polarity on those, uh, they then are still uh, congruent to the rest of the mix. They don't see the drums, they just get the big sound of the room, especially when you compress them a lot. Which brings us on to the processing that we did while we were there. So every channel that we recorded was all recorded through Middle Farm's Trident console. So it was Trident preamps on everything. There was a little bit of EQ on some of the drums, but nothing major. We didn't want to really spoil the feel of the, the drums in terms of the tracking. The uh, snare and the kick and all of the toms all went through their own DBX160 compressor. And each one was taking two or three dB off so that each one of those drums got an extra bit of punch on them so that, that that was done in serial and so that was done as an insert on each one of those and they were committed straight to the recording as was all of this. Also the kick and the snare were then parallel sent out to an 1176 each uh, which we then had separately recorded so we could blend them in as necessary because the, the one on the kick especially really gave it some extra anger. And what else did we do? So we had a Manly ELOP limiter that was uh, taking a copy, a parallel copy of the room sound and absolutely smashing that to death, which really gave a massive sound. Another thing that we had going on is we had all the shells paralleled through an old DBX compander, which uh, traditionally they were supposed to be used with a DBX kind of system. Uh, but what you can do as a trick is you can send everything through it and it kind of does this instant attack, instant release, really aggressive compression, which can be blended in. And also, these guys had a real EMT-140 plate reverb, which was incredible. So we had that in the basement, and we uh, routed out the snare through a gate and then to the plate. And that was recorded in separately, so we could blend that in later. And that really added a certain something on the processing chain because a real EMT reverb, you don't get to use that kind of thing every day. So absolutely we did that. Now we're going to go to Studio B, which is my mix room, and have a look at the processing that I've done after the fact, which uh, has brought out some of the qualities of these kind of things, which is, you know, the kind of thing that someone like Bob Clear Mountain would have done, even with the best recordings in the world. You take those really good sounding clean recordings and you mix them after the fact. So here we go. So this is what the drums sound like. So there's there's other bits that aren't on here, like there's, there's no toms on here, but there is another song that we tracked where I'll play you a couple of little bits with the toms, like this. So yeah, I, I don't want to dwell on that because that's a, a track that has not yet been released. So I'm just going to use little bits of that to give you those kind of examples. But yes, let's look at what I've done and what each thing sounds like on uh, the ultimate drum sound. 
I have a few little bits going on the master bus, like I've got the Shadow Hills Class A black box uh, HG2, which is a little bit of a saturator, and I've got flatline from submission, which is just a limiter. And you'll see the compression on here is doing almost nothing. So apart from a volume boost, if I turn all this off, it shouldn't sound that different. So yeah, there's a subtle difference there, but it's not huge. Uh, so I'll, again, I'll not dwell on that. The kick drum, let's listen to that for a second. That sounds like this all in. So it's got some dynamics going on there and it, it sounds almost kind of sampled. And there is a sample in there, which I will freely admit, but we'll get to that. So uh, the overall processing, what I've done is I've blended the four kick sources, the three microphones and the 1176 that we had in parallel, and they're just on faders. And they're being sent into a folder with this, which is, uh, that one's completely disabled. So I'm just going to get rid of that to keep things simple visually. So I've got a gate here, the, uh, the drum gate. If I turn that off. It's not unreasonable, but I wanted to just clean it up a little. Then there's an LA-2A giving us a little bit of compression with a relatively slow attack. And then there is an EQ, which is adding some low end, adding around 200 hertz, just a little bit in that broad SSL style, and a little bit up at 7.5k as a shelf which if I turn all those off, it should sound fine, just not quite as bah. And those I'm using as a kind of a, a creative EQ to just give me a little more of what I want. I'm not having to fix any issues. So let's just take this gate off for a second while I show you the drum separately. This is the Beta 91 I was talking about, clicky clicky. So that really does have that pa paf pa paf kind of clicky thing. Then there's the D12, which is in the sound hole. Which has a kind of a rounder flavor to it. But if I play these two together, That's quite a lot rounder, but really has that punch. And then the kick sub, which is that handmade sub mic, sounds like this. Which sounds kind of useless on its own, but again, with no EQing, I'm gonna bring this in after a couple of beats and you'll hear the immediate low end difference. And then we've got this 1176 on the kick, which is very clicky. But it's much smoother because it's being compressed on the way in quite heavily. Uh, there's less dynamic on it. But when I play that with the other three channels, the dynamics are still there, but we can hear every hit. And so on that, I then re-enable that gate, which isn't the most aggressive gate in the world. And suddenly, I might even extend the release of that gate out just a little. And that's starting to sound like a really good kick. And then I have a trigger, kind of to my shame, but it's because I wanted to add something that I like to this kick. And I just, it, it, because of my weird sense of humor, I called this channel Bonk, because this, I'll just play it on its own. Sounds like Bonk. And that's from Billy Decker.
it's Billy Decker, a couple of his uh, kicks, which have a very definite kind of uh, an impact that is quite unnatural. Uh, but when blended in with the very natural and very dynamic kick, just help to even it out for me. So I'll just turn that off and then on. There we go. And so with a really dynamic kick, that's added into it and gives it uh, that big presence in the mix. So that sounds huge. The snare was an interesting one as well. Let's just solo the snare up. So the snare with those Neumann mics, uh, here's the snare on top. So lots of ring, lots of attack. Uh, the underneath mic. Sounds like a classic under snare mic, and that's just got a little bit of air. And actually, this, this FG Dynamics is disabled. I must have been playing around with it. Same one here, so there's no processing on the snare top. A little bit of uh, air on the bottom. Uh, because it's a really even-sounding uh, microphone, that Neumann, it doesn't have a presence peak, so I use that air plugin to bring that in. And then there's the 1176, which is paralleled on the snare. And so that's got nothing going on with the dynamics either. I've disabled that. Uh, those all go together. And there's quite a lot of bleed on there, but it seems to have worked absolutely fine in this mix. And then there's some uh, presence and low end boost and a little bit of a, a bus drive here. Split EQ is working wonders here in snare mode and is separating the transient. with the tonal section, which is very much that ring. And now I have a balance. And if that ring is too much in the mix, I just have a slider for it. So I might take that down by a couple of dB and that I don't need a gate and I don't need a separate transient designer. That's amazing. But I do like to have some ring on the snare, especially when those heavy guitars are going to come in. They are going to swallow up a lot of details like ring on a snare. So you find yourself bringing that back in where you would have thought it was too much. Be careful of that. And then I do have a, a sample on the snare as well, but mostly this sample is an Andy Wallace trick, which is to have drum rooms uh, as a trigger so that you get a big sound that is completely isolated. Uh, so it doesn't have any cymbal wash or anything on it. Uh, so that's what I've done here with this. I'm not using this uh, Savage Snare sample, I'm just using the Savage Snare room. And so when I use all of these together, it gives a big 3D sound to the snare on the hits without adding any complication from gating and cymbal bleed and all that kind of stuff. And so there you go. The, the toms uh, were, like I said, with the DBXs. And so if I solo these on the other song, I have been quite aggressive with the manual gating here. I could probably be a little more delicate there. But in context, that does what it needs to do. And each one of these has one of my favorite plugins called Gatey Weighty from Boz Labs, which is a frequency dependent gate that just lets the high or the low end through depending on how you have it set. And then that's going through to, of course, the slate stuff. Uh, the gate there has been turned off in favor of the Boz Labs one in that particular case. And I've done some crazy things like have a distressor on these. 
which only takes a few dB off. And then there's the real tone sculpting kind of Chris Lord algae style. Like on this particular tom, round 200 hertz has just been cranked. Uh, because like Chris Lord, Al Lord algae says, don't be afraid of those EQ knobs if it gets you what you want. And in the case of these toms, the different frequencies uh, have been twisted and the, the floor tom not so much, but that's got more of a, a lower bell uh, to bring that out. Because as good as those toms sounded, uh, I just wanted to pull out the fundamental notes of each one and really let those shine because I like to have quite full sounding toms. And because of all the bleed on those AKG 414s, um, a copy of Soothe on the Tom Group helps to tame that down. And there you go, See, uh, kind of kept those in check. So on to what I call the tops, which is you know overhead mics, room mics, that kind of stuff. And you can see here we have lots and lots going on. So we had a hi-hat mic and a ride mic. The hi-hat mic was an original SM7, just because we could. And the ride mic, I think, was a ribbon mic from underneath. I think it was a Bayer 160. Which don't add a great deal on this song because neither symbol was actually used, but they are part of the overall sound of the mix. Uh, but we rely a lot more on the overheads of which there were the Neumanns. Very clean, very precise. Then there's the Coles. Much more meaty sounding. And then we get to the AEA ribbon, which is in the middle of the room, and you'll hear suddenly it opens up. Listening to those, I think we had an extra... A compressor which those were rooted through. I think it might have been a manly, but not the ELOP. Uh, that that was done as an insert on the way in. And then we've got the uh, the AKG 414s, which were at the back, turned round with the polarity reversed, and they sounded huge like this. And all together with the faders ridden. Sounds massive. So we've got the custom series EQ, which is kind of a Pultec style lift, a little bit of a 300 hertz kind of SSL style dip and a little bit of boost in the lows just to get those shells uh, coming through a little bit more uh, with the cymbals because I do like rooms and overheads to contribute to the Tom snare shell sounds. Uh, I just like the way that works. And then split EQ to the rescue again. So there's a high pass filter and then the split between transient and tonal was, because I blended all the mics into one here, there were some strident frequencies I was playing with. This is on full drum set mode, which is similar to overhead kind of mode. Uh, there is a cymbal mode, but because of the room mics and all the extra low stuff, I used the full drum set mode and that allowed the shells to come through more. So if we hear the transients on there only, compared to the tone, which they sound weird separately, but together you get this. And without. There we go. So without, you can hear some ringing in some of the uh, the, the shells, like the, the toms all have been ringing from the resonance from the rest of the kit. And there was a little bit extra kind of flab in the low end, so it was quite ill-defined. I'll play it again with this bypassed. And then with the, the split EQ in. And you can hear how a lot of the, the shell ringing has been taken out there. Uh, but if there are any big hits, then the transient side of the split EQ lifts them out instead of taking them down. Very, very clever stuff. And that all goes together to give us this massive sound. And then we add the last little bit of flavouring at the end.
Ah, there's more than one. So that's that's the manly slam, I think it was. A lot of the overheads and rooms were sent through a very aggressive compressor, which I've uh, used an API EQ to really kind of sculpt this out and make sure it's not overly interfering with the rest of the mix. Then there was the ELOP limiter, which with a split EQ to just bring out some crack, but also uh, shelve out the lows on that. That sounds like this. Which again, if we turn those all off. Sounds good, but it doesn't have that oomph. And then, last but not least, there is a real EMT plate, which sounds like this. Which, I don't know if we did have the gate on there, actually. Um, we did on another track, so it might just be that we left that open. You can hear the other microphones uh, providing a little bit of bleed into the EMT. But if I turn off that snare room sample and the EMT, it suddenly sounds very dry. So if I bring in the EMT that's already 13 dB down, we get... And then that snare room sample... we get a big, shiny, massive drum sound. And in the next few weeks, we're going to add to that with the ultimate bass, ultimate guitars, and make this a big wall of rock noise. So there we go. The uh, There's so much going on there that I really can't wait to share with you the ultimate bass and ultimate guitar videos where we're going to go absolutely bananas as well. The bass is going to have four different sources, the guitar is going to have four different mics and then it's going to be split and blended and there's all sorts of crazy stuff going on there. And we'll do a vocal video as well where I'll find the, you know, my favourite vocal mic and then parallel that through all the, the nice hardware. This is me going absolutely crazy as much as is possible to kind of test the limits play with all the toys and mixing techniques as much as is possible so if this is the kind of thing where you're going well i don't have all that gear uh, well half the time especially no neither do i with the drums that kind of thing but knowing the possibilities is a lot of fun and you can replicate a lot of this stuff in software. You can do this with far more basic systems. A lot of the techniques are things like you know, the well-tuned drums and the good room and where you put the mics and all that kind of stuff. And you can DIY so much of this, which is the really exciting thing. And this is just, like I said, me going absolutely crazy to, to show you an interesting journey. Thanks so much, Adam. I hope you all enjoyed that episode. I'm really excited for his ultimate series. Check out the description below for links to Adam's courses over at promixacademy.com, as well as to his YouTube channel, Hot Pulse Studios, and links to other goodies that we supply. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like and subscribe and tune in for more. Till next time, everyone. Have a marvelous day.